In this lecture, we'd like to talk about Schopenhauer, one of Nietzsche's definitive influences. But more generally, we'd like to broach the question of pessimism, that view that the world and life really is no good. Pessimism, by one consideration, might be thought of as a kind of quantitative measure. The question, is your life more pleasure or more pain? And of course, most of my 20-year-old students argue without a hesitation that it's much more pleasure. And I remind them that it's not over yet, and I tell them some of the things that might happen to them and some of the things that certainly will happen to them as they get older. And of course, in the end, um, we're all dead. And so they get very disturbed by this, but they're still perfectly willing to assert, or at least hope, that the balance will be in favor of pleasure. Schopenhauer doesn't believe that. Schopenhauer seems to feel that life is basically suffering, and that the amount of pleasure, well, take it, enjoy it, but it really isn't what life is all about. This quantitative idea that life is more pain than pleasure is, of course, subject to many different objections. For one thing, just the notion of quantification is itself rather difficult. How do we know what we're quantifying when we quantify pleasure and pain? But Nietzsche would want to say more to the point that pleasure and pain aren't really what life is about. But there's a different kind of way of thinking about pessimism, which is far more philosophical. The more philosophical way of thinking about pessimism is that life doesn't have a purpose, or life doesn't have a meaning. Now, there's several different ways that this might be argued. One, and perhaps the most common, uh, particularly in the 19th century and now the 20th, is that what gives meaning and purpose to the world is God. Schopenhauer is an atheist. In fact, Nietzsche says in praise of Schopenhauer, he is the first honest German atheist. If there's no God, one might argue, then the world doesn't have a purpose. There's nothing to guide us, no ultimate goals that are given to us. And the world itself has no meaning. And if you look at the world as a naturalist, and in particular, if you look at the world as both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche tend to do, through the eyes of a biologist, then you can sort of see the point. What Schopenhauer argues, in exquisite detail, because he really knew a lot about the life sciences of his day, is that if you look at how creatures live, there's basically just one continuous cycle to it, and to talk about it having an ultimate meaning or purpose really doesn't make much sense. He uses an example, one of those many insects that develop over a long larval stage, emerge in some cases for a single day in their full maturity to mate, after which they quickly die. And their offspring, after spending some time in the larval stage, emerge fully grown, mate, and die. And this cycle goes on, in many cases, for millions of years. But of course, what does that add up to? It's just a cycle of life and death, but it doesn't add up to anything. It has no ultimate purpose. It has no ultimate meaning. If you watch your dog through his or her daily life, weekly life, monthly life, yearly life, we watch our dogs, whom we adore, now at age 11. And there's a sense in which they're now slow puppies. There's a sense in which what they want out of life is pretty much what they wanted out of life when they were 10 weeks old. There's a sense in which they have no anticipation of what is going to happen to them, not too soon, I hope. There's a sense in which what they do is they live for what they want to do that day. In fact, we sometimes joke. When a dog, and especially when a puppy wakes up in the morning, it's not just a brand new day. It's a brand new life. 
And there's this sense, dogs can have a wonderful life. I often envy it. But the truth is, what does a dog's life add up to? That, I presume, is what's meant by the phrase, a dog's life. Because most <laughs> dogs don't live badly at all. Nevertheless, it doesn't add up to anything. It doesn't have a purpose. It doesn't have a meaning. And that, quite frankly, doesn't have all that much to do with whether or not dogs believe in God. The idea of life simply going on, fulfilling itself, repeating itself, is really the heart of a certain kind of pessimism. I remember a cartoon that was popular just a couple of months ago, and it was essentially one of these cartoons about evolution. The first frame was a little creature crawling out of the water, and in its little bubble mind, it was thinking, eat, survive, reproduce. Then it had another creature that was clearly a land creature, and in its little bubble of a mind said, eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce. And then they had something that looked like a primitive primate who was thinking, eat, survive, reproduce. And the final frame was a human being who was scratching his head and saying, what's it all mean? <laughs> and it seems to characterize very well. On the one hand, we're just another step in evolution, although I should point out that Schopenhauer is writing before Darwin. We're just another step in evolution. We are animals. But nevertheless, the idea that we are somehow special, that we are in a position to discover the meaning of life, is an illusion. Now, why is that? Because Schopenhauer had a view, and in fact, it's remarkably similar to his arch rival, Hegel, who was at one point teaching in the same university, Berlin, at the same time. And that is the view that the world is one, that it's a unity, that there is really one reality underlying all things. Schopenhauer, however, takes this view not from Hegel, whom he despised, nor does he even take it directly from the ancient Greeks, who sometimes held similar views. But much to his credit, Schopenhauer was the first philosopher to take seriously the philosophy of the Far East, Indian philosophy in particular, and he knew Buddhism, he knew a good deal about Hinduism, and the philosophy of Brahman that I mentioned before, the philosophy that the world is really one reality, was a philosophy that he embraced. But that one reality had a peculiar characteristic. It was in the terms that were widely used at the time. It was will. Now, the important thing for Schopenhauer is to understand what that means. The notion of will was used very uh, centrally by the great German philosopher who preceded him, and he was certainly Schopenhauer's model, Immanuel Kant. For Kant, will was, first of all, something that each of us exercised, and will was necessarily rational. That doesn't mean that everything we do is rational, but it meant that to have a will and to have reason and to have morality, or at least have the understanding of morality, these were all of a package. In Schopenhauer, the will is no longer individual. The will is, in fact, the one reality. And we know the will through ourselves, but nevertheless, what we know through ourselves is reality as such. But of course, there's something else we know too. And to put it very simply, it's the world. In Kant, that old picture that comes from the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle in particular, the picture that comes through the history of Christianity of two worlds, one a kind of immediate secular world and the other of a more perfect world, takes the very sophisticated variation that on one hand, there's the world of our experience, what Kant calls the phenomenal world. And then on the other hand, there's the world as it is in itself, that is, as the world would be if we did not perceive it through all of our senses. Now, that's an impossible notion, and Kant realizes that's an empty notion for us, 
But nevertheless, God sees the world, or knows the world, in a way that's very different from the way we know the world. And so that notion of the world in itself is something that Kant distinguishes from the world of our experience. What's more, that world as it is in itself has a function. It is, perhaps first and foremost, the realm of God. It is the otherworldly. It is also, however, the realm of human freedom and human action. And what we experience in ourselves, in fact, is the freedom to act, which is something different from seeing ourselves as just participants in the world. So, with this dichotomy, Schopenhauer then says the following, and this is a combination of Kant and Buddhism. The world is phenomenon, the world of experience, is to a large extent a world of illusion. On the other hand, the world that we experience inside, the world of the will, that's the real world. And what's more, it's not individual will, but all wills are ultimately one. But most importantly, this will is not rational. This will doesn't have an ultimate purpose, as Kant certainly thinks it does. The will is really, I always think of it as something like a tornado. It's something that sort of swirls around and strives inside of us and throws us from one place to the other. It's always presenting us with goals and demands, desires. But it doesn't stop. It can't be satisfied. Perhaps the most illustrative example, one that Schopenhauer actually uses quite often, that all of us can relate to is sexual desire. Think, for example, when you were a teenager and just discovering this. The experience was that here is this enormous force speaking to you from inside of you. And at the time, you had no idea where it was coming from, where it was going, what you were supposed to do with it, what you recognized, what you could not but recognize was its power and its force. Well, you got more sophisticated. You realized there are ways of answering this desire. But are there ways of satisfying it? And the answer is no. Goethe in Faust says at one point, from desire, of course, I rush to satisfaction. But from satisfaction, I leap to desire. The truth is that satisfaction is always followed by desire. Sexual satisfaction is very brief, and the desire comes back. And this cycle continues throughout life. In fact, one can ask the following question. What is it you desire when you have sexual desire? Now, of course, in immediate personal terms, it might just be, I want to make love to this person that I love. Or it might just be, I want an evening as evening's entertainment. Or it might be, I want to prove I'm a man, or I want to prove I'm a beautiful woman. But all that's beside the point. The truth is, it's the will speaking from within us. The will as the demand for the continuation of the species. But there, we're right back to where the dogs and the insects that mate one day of their lives and lower creatures as well. It is simply life insisting on reproducing itself, the species insisting on going on. But if the question is, why? There's no answer to that. We are simply buffeted by the will, and that's the end of it. Now that's a pretty bleak picture. The story of the universe that Schopenhauer tells doesn't give us much consolation. The one, perhaps, potentially consoling thing is that Schopenhauer claims that along with our general sense of satisfying our individual desires, something he claims is an illusion, he also thinks that it's really an illusion to uh, concern ourselves with our individual existence. Ultimately, we're all one thing, and although for many of us an uh, overwhelming preoccupation is um, a concern with the fact that we're mortal, Schopenhauer claims that this is really a kind of illusory problem. If we're all this fundamental one force that expresses itself in nature, our individual death really doesn't mean much of anything. In effect, um, what goes on, nature, is really all that we were originally 
So we might take comfort in the thought that what's really real in us, what's important in us, continues despite our individual demise. Nevertheless, not too many people find that all that reassuring, and Schopenhauer is well aware of it. The, general the generally pessimistic tone of his writing has a lot to do with the fact that he thinks most of us aren't going to take any solace in that and aren't going to draw the appropriate conclusions. He does, however, mention a couple of ways that many of us at least avoid dwelling on what's unpleasant for us. He thinks that there is a kind of respite from willing and either getting satisfied and briefly bored or willing, getting satisfied and immediately willing again. The main way in which people take a kind of break from all this is through aesthetic experience. Indeed, I think it's noteworthy that while Schopenhauer paints a very pessimistic and disturbing picture of the world as a whole, his specific examples indicate, just in the way he writes about them, a kind of aesthetic appreciation. He takes joy in learning about biological examples. And even though the upshot is often exactly what Bob described, a kind of sense that this is a continuing saga that ultimately signifies nothing, nevertheless, one gets the impression that he really takes great delight in observing and recognizing the ways in which nature works. Schopenhauer's own theory acknowledges that this is a, the main way that a lot of us find at least temporary meaning in our lives. He talks about aesthetic experience as a kind of Sabbath from the penal servitude of willing. His conception of aesthetic experience draws on yet another of his philosophical heroes besides the Buddha and Kant, namely Plato. He draws from Plato's notion of the forms or ideas, prototypes for the particular individual things that we observe in the phenomenal world. According to Plato, for example, when we see something beautiful, we're seeing an instance that has many, many different illustrations, an instance of something that participates in a fundamental pattern, absolute beauty. And in a sense, when we recognize beauty in the here and now, in a particular thing, we're actually turning our minds towards something that's more fundamental, universal, and eternal, namely beauty itself. Schopenhauer's way of dealing with this notion of forms is to say that most artists depict things, depict particular things, but in a way that makes us mindful of these universal prototypes or patterns. So a sculptor that, uh, for instance, sculpts a wolf will in a sense have in mind the basic prototype or pattern of a wolf. And it will be the universal notion of wolfness, you might say, that comes through in what the artist does to the extent the artist really um, is in control of his or her art. What this does for us in terms of willing is it allows us an occasion to simply rest content with contemplating. Once again, the kind of contemplation we discussed in an earlier lecture becomes a very significant and important component of life. As Schopenhauer sees it, when we can just contemplate the basic patterns of the world, we no longer have our usual disposition, which is to gaze around us and itemize things in terms of things that I want, things I don't want, things that help me get what I want, or things that obstruct me. All of those kind of relations we have to things tend to put us in a rather aggressive, antagonistic, and ultimately frustrated state of mind toward the rest of reality. When we observe something in an aesthetic light, however, and Schopenhauer here would include beautiful nature along with art, what we do is transport our gaze away from particular objects of desire for me, the individual, to the universal beauty of this type of thing. Similarly, when I do that, I'm no longer relating to myself as an individual that either does or does not get what I desire. Instead, I think of myself as a kind of universal being as well. If I gaze at the universal form of something through a particular in art or beautiful nature, at the same time, I'm making myself a kind of universal case of a human being contemplating. Schopenhauer calls this uh, the pure, willless subject of knowledge. I'm willless because I'm not relating to myself as a private person with desires 
perhaps with greed, but instead thinking of myself as the mind, the mind of the human being. And with that, I at least take a break from willing, trying to get what I want. For the time being, I don't even think about desire. Unfortunately, this blessed state of mind doesn't last very long. Uh, for the most part, we go to an art gallery and perhaps experience beauty, but eventually get hungry and turn our minds back to desire. Um, if we're particularly unfortunate, we might even start thinking about desiring art itself, uh, wanting to own rather than simply contemplate. So Schopenhauer thinks sooner or later, inevitably desire catches up with us again. There is, however, however one other aesthetic kind of appreciation that he discusses and that Nietzsche draws upon, actually, um, the aesthetic appreciation we have of music. Now, Schopenhauer, being a 19th century thinker, does not have in mind the kind of abstract visual arts that um, are very common fare today. He tends to think of all the visual arts as presenting depictions or representations. On the other hand, he thinks of music as something that is much more formal. Um, music doesn't seem to be mimicking anything in particular in the world, although we feel that it has a very intimate connection with our world. And Nietzsche's, uh, sorry, Schopenhauer's way of understanding this, um, again, a theme that Nietzsche picks up on, is that in music what we have is something like a representation of the will itself, the way in which the will moves through nature, the kind of um, inner conflict of the will, which we might see in musical dissonance, and its resolution in stages of relative consonance, for example. Schopenhauer is convinced that the reason we find music so moving is it bypasses representing things in the external world, and we feel more that it's intimately in connection with this inner stirring, the will as it acts in ourselves. So a musical condition is particularly important for us because, again, it draws our attention to what's universal within us, the very phenomena of the will manifesting itself through us. And by doing that, it makes us, again, mindful of our, our real existence, ourselves as members of a species, manifestations of a will, which fundamentally make us all one. However, like the visual arts, music usually doesn't sustain us through a lifetime. Even though we might be transported by the occasional concert, most likely we spend much of our life willing, getting frustrated, willing, getting satisfied and bored, and then willing again. The only ultimate solution for human beings is really to somehow move one's sense of self away from personal, private aims, the kind of everyday willing that we all engage in, to shift from that sense of who we are to a totally universalized concept. And that, he thinks, is something that the saints of various traditions have achieved. Schopenhauer's conception of life being full of frustration and desire draws a lot from the Buddhist notion of life being suffering. And Schopenhauer also follows the Buddha in suggesting that the only real solution to this is to get over this kind of continual craving. So if we can manage to start to see ourselves as really the same self as everyone else, competing with them for particular good things that we want seems rather pointless. If we really register this, if we really come to take this to heart, then the whole project of willing, trying to get what we individually desire, starts to seem more and more pointless. And if we really do maintain this kind of insight, then what will happen naturally is we'll, we'll simply stop. We'll come to a state of what Schopenhauer describes as resignation. We'll resign from willing. Now, how does all this relate to Nietzsche? Nietzsche tends to follow Schopenhauer a long way in this account. Nietzsche, as we discussed in earlier lectures, was quite convinced that life does entail a certain amount of frustration, downright suffering, and ultimate death. So he thinks Schopenhauer is certainly pursuing the right track to try to encourage us to um, think about this, to recognize the truth of this, and not whitewash it. On the other hand, Nietzsche thinks that Schopenhauer perhaps gives aesthetic experience a little bit too short shrift. As Nietzsche sees it, there is a kind of aesthetic way of 
dealing with the whole problem of individual frustration, suffering, and death. He comments in The Birth of Tragedy, only as an aesthetic phenomenon is life eternally justified. In other words, Nietzsche is suggesting that there is a kind of answer to the problem of evil that aesthetics, art, can provide. And this particular answer is an answer that has to do with seeing the world, in a sense, from this point of view of ourselves as universal. Instead of thinking of ourselves as just one more phenomenon, fighting it out with the rest, as we observe the world as an aesthetic phenomena, we think of the way all of these things go together. Nietzsche thinks if we really do this, it doesn't really matter to us as much that we're in the competition, in the general fray, and sometimes get frustrated during the course of it. That's simply what participating in life involves or entails. And that, he thinks, is something that we can come to grips with and actually appreciate so long as we maintain awareness that that's our individual participation in this much bigger thing, this, in a sense, more real thing, life as a whole. One might compare the way that Schopenhauer and Nietzsche think differently on these issues by noting that Schopenhauer really thinks that ultimate satisfaction is what, what we really want. And we're going to be frustrated unless we get to a state where we're completely content. Nietzsche thinks that that really doesn't have much to do with life as it's lived, and if we think about it, isn't really what we want. The nature of life is to be in a state of continual change, a state of movement, a state, if you want to call it this, of frustration, but that this frustration is actually something we can appreciate itself, something uh, along the lines of our appreciation of musical dissonance, which is a state, a particular moment in music, where you certainly have the sense that you need to move from that, but that moving itself is what life consists of. Strangely, although Schopenhauer um, shares many of the presuppositions that Nietzsche does, Nietzsche thinks Schopenhauer is really looking for a kind of stasis, a state of perfect contentment, where you don't need to strive anymore. Um, you're finally fully satisfied. And Nietzsche thinks what we ought to throw out is not our desires, but the sense that a kind of position of perfect satisfaction is either attainable or desirable. So Nietzsche does, in a sense, take a more optimistic view than Schopenhauer. He buys the pessimistic premises that start Schopenhauer's own philosophy, um, the premise that, indeed, individuals are inevitably subject to suffering and death. But nevertheless, he thinks that we need not look at this as a kind of argument against the value of life, um, taking a kind of uh, source of sustenance from being part of life, from being part of the motion or the dynamic of life, rather than looking for a peaceful state in which to live out your days is what we ought to do. Despite this relative optimism, however, Nietzsche is not um, favoring a kind of cheap whitewashing of reality. So he tends to think that too much focus on optimism, as some people who look at the Greeks and say, oh, how cheerful they were, he thinks that's not really a good thing either, that we should recognize that life involves these various um, negative components, but nevertheless approach the world at, with what he calls strong pessimism. Uh, a sense that we can really deal with this and even take joy in it. Nietzsche's relative optimism, or what he often calls cheerfulness, I find not always convincing. You get the sense that here is a man who desperately wants to feel good about life and cheerful, but nevertheless there's a sense that throughout his entire life he's really saddled with Schopenhauer's pessimism or a version of it and is trying to convince himself that life is really worthwhile despite all of the suffering. But this leads to another way of looking at pessimism and looking at the meaning of life. Schopenhauer ultimately seems to think that meaning, purpose, is to be found in a kind of rationality. That's what Kant thought. Nevertheless, what Nietzsche points out, and I think very powerfully, is that the meaning of life is to be found not in reason, not in rationality, not in some calculation, much less in theology, but the meaning of life is to be found in the passions. That it's creativity, it's being devoted to causes, it's being dedicated to something, another person, a project, an art, 
That's what gives life meaning. And so pessimism is overcome as an aesthetic phenomenon, not as a reason, not as a rational enterprise, but rather by something you really care about, something you feel deeply passionate about.